I want to take a moment to tell you about the day that I saw the light. My college roommate, who had worked as a successful celebrity makeup artist, they had traveled the world with the likes of Alicia Keys and Paul Abdul, decided with her husband that they would relocate from New York City to Atlanta and chase the American dream. And one day I went to visit their house. And as she and I sat there catching up, she offered me a glass of water. When she opened her refrigerator door, I could immediately see from the front to the back. As she turned around, she saw that shocked look in my eyes. And she stood there, pregnant with her second child and burst into tears, telling me that she knew what I was thinking. And that while she always tried to keep meals and snacks in the house for her two-year-old son, they often didn't have the money to. And what I remember most about that day was this bright light shining in my eyes from this empty refrigerator. This is a plight that far too many people face. One thing that a lot of people don't know about me is that I actually have a fear of public speaking. And a lot of it is just because I have such a high-pitched voice. And people used to make fun of me a lot when I was a kid, you know. I was, I was told like, oh, you sound like you're white, or you sound like you're Mickey Mouse, or you just, you know, inhaled a bunch of helium. But I was really desperate, you know. A lot of people, when they're creating a startup, they have the ability to go to friends and family, you know, what you would call like an angel round or a friends and family round. Well, for me, my parents had just got divorced after 36 years of being together. Um, my sister was just graduating from Spelman College. And so my internal resources were tapped. And so if I wanted to start Gooder, I was gonna really have to raise money in unconventional ways. As many people know, I had just broken up with my ex at the time, and my friend, uh, Dawn Dixon, who's another fellow entrepreneur, she was living in Miami, and she was like, you should come to Miami, you know, get away. It was my birthday in February. And so I literally, my mom brought me the plane ticket. This is how broke I was. I was about to move out of that house with my ex. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have a lot of money saved up, but things had just gotten really bad, so I knew I needed to go. And my mom brought me a plane ticket on Frontier, for like $100, and I went to Miami with my friend Dawn, and there was an event happening called Black Tech Week. And it was basically a gathering of black tech founders. And I'm sitting in all of these sessions, and I'm thinking to myself, like, I should create an app. Like, I should create an app that would get food donated to me so that I could feed people. So if businesses have food, you know, it'll work just like that. And I'm sitting in that program, and that's what I'm thinking. That was like my first kind of introduction to technology. And so I get back from Black Tech Weekend, I move out of my ex's house, move in with my friends. So I, I went from living in like a six bedroom, probably 5,000 square foot house, um, to living in a one bedroom on a full bed, you know, and with a friend of mine that was married with children. And so it was a big change for me. You know, we decided to become roommates again. And here we are, two grown women, me with a family, and we decided to just start over, you know? So I've watched her sit in a room for hours on end with a computer in the dark, coming up with a, a plan and a vision and to see her come out of that space and put that plan into action has been very inspiring. I was still trying to get this app built and I had nothing. And so I was meeting with different app developers and they would say things like, oh yeah, that doesn't make sense. I don't think it's gonna scale. It just doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. And I really just thought, well, maybe I don't, I don't have you know, the chops to do this. Maybe it's just a big idea. It's probably never gonna happen. And then I went to Haiti in September of 2016 and just saw so much poverty and devastation. And I just was like, you know, at some point, Jasmine, you've really got to just go after your dreams. You know, you're 30. If you don't do it now, when are you going to do it? Like, this is, it's just time to do it. And so I get back from Haiti. I see that there is a hackathon on gentrification. And it was sponsored by Google for Startups and a program called Goody Nation. And I knew the founder, Joey Womack, pretty well. And I DM'd him and said, hey, I'm thinking about applying. He was like, you know, the application is due at 12 o'clock. I think at this time it's like 10 30, 10 45. So I run and like get to a place where I have Wi-Fi, apply, and I got into the program, and I was a team of one. In Goody Nation, we're running our first ever 
cohort of our pre-accelerator, uh, sponsored by Google, matter of fact. And so uh, it is one hour until the application deadline is over. With. And so a few minutes later, I receive an email from Jasmine saying, hey, I have this idea to uh, recover food that's gonna be thrown away and take it to churches and nonprofits. She's like, will this qualify for your social impact pre-accelerator? And I'm like, yes, this is awesome. So I said, hey, you have one hour to apply for this program. Cause I'd actually pushed back the deadline a few days uh, just to get a little bit more um, people or a lot of people to, to really uh, apply. And so she applied with maybe 15 minutes left. I look over the application, super thorough, like super long. And I said, like, this is, this is a winner. And so the next day we're at Atlanta Tech Village up in Buckhead and it's 30 to 40 founders. Most of them are actually uh, in groups, right? So they're, they're co-founders. Jasmine's one of the only people in the group who's by herself. He sat by her side and we walked through these, these founders through this design thinking process in order to identify their, their customers, their problems, and come up with the features for the idea. It is highly unusual for one person to go through this exercise, especially by themselves with very little help, and to come up with a really, really solid idea. And I sat there and watched her. I was a little bit nervous at first, but I saw how focused she was, and she just absolutely nailed it. I was literally drawing cell phone squares, like little squares. This is the chef. This is gonna be the driver. This is gonna be the nonprofit. This is what the app will look like and there was pizza left over at that event and I literally recorded it and I was like, this is my app in motion, this is what it's gonna look like. And you know, I took that food and then I took it downtown to where I always feed at, like within minutes and then it was gone. And I, I felt like this could work, like it could really work if I kept working on it. So it's roughly six weeks after that first session. Most of the founders are going through, they are uh, kind of refining their ideas. Jasmine actually put it into action and started to uh, actually rescue food herself with no with no technology. And so we go to middle of October 2016. At this point, she had rescued about a thousand pounds of food. Like this is highly abnormal for someone to go from idea to start actually doing it in a more kind of somewhat scalable way, but with no technology. And so she's crushing the first two days of the program. Friday and Saturday, she has a team behind her. She's, she's really rallying them. They're, they're doing some amazing work. And the objective of this hackathon is to go from idea to building essentially a pilot. And throughout that entire hackathon, which is about three months, it was from October till December, I never won. You know, so I would get up there and I would pitch my idea and my team would put all this stuff together and we never won. So we never won first place and I felt like even the judges at the hackathon would be like, yeah, I don't get this. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not really, I don't think it's, it makes that much sense. But what's funny is we're the only company, there's one other company, Civic Dinners, of the entire 20 or so teams in those hackathons that's still standing. And me or Civic Dinners never won. So I think a lot of times it's not about winning first place. It's not about you know winning, it's really about persistence and it's about continuing to go after it. And that's all I had. I mean, if I didn't have anything, I was really working to make Gooder happen every day. Like they're just, without a doubt, I was, I was gonna make it happen. I never forget it. Uh, she, she's working super hard and the, the, the hackathon was held in Tech Square in Midtown Atlanta. And for whatever reason, I think because of uh, some type of festival or something, there was surge pricing going on in, in Uber. And Jasmine was catching Uber back and forth and she says, Joby, like, hey, it's costing me a hundred dollars one way to come back to the hackathon. And I'm like, and she's like, hey, like, I'm not gonna be able to afford to stick in the program and come back on Sunday, the closing day, where she's gonna present in front of judges, including investors. And it was a no brainer for me. Um, I wasn't gonna let her drop out. When, no matter what I had to do, I was going to, to make it happen. And so even if I had to jump on a bike, go down to her house and pick her up, I was gonna make it happen. And so I ended up just going in and getting $200, sent it to her via PayPal, I said, hey, don't worry about it. Just, uh, just make this thing happen. She showed up the next day, absolutely crushed the pitch competition with some very impressive people in the audience and in the, on the judging committee. She won it and the rest is history. When I was practicing for my pitch competitions, I would practice day and night, like without a doubt. So when I tell you, I practiced thousands and thousands of times, and that's why I won. It wasn't any other reason than the fact that I was ready. So practice definitely makes perfect. And this is one of the songs I used to practice to. 
and it was Future's Mask Off. And as soon as this song would start, right here is the little hook that I would just wait for the music to start, and I would kind of just be breathing. And this song is three minutes and 25 seconds. So I knew three minutes, this was my pitch if I started rapping when Future started talking. And I would say, every year in this country, more than 40 million people go hungry. Yet at the same time, we waste 72 billion pounds of perfectly good food. Food waste encompasses 27% of everything in our landfills today. And as this food sits, it gradually rots and produces harmful methane gas, a leading contributor to global climate change. These are problems, and they're ones that we're laser focused on solving. Because nationwide tonight, while businesses throw away millions of dollars of perfectly good food, one in six people will go to bed hungry. Still to come on Growing Gooder. Today is the grand opening of the Gooder headquarters right here off of the Beltline in Midtown Atlanta. And I am so excited. We have a lot of people coming to celebrate with us. We are getting a proclamation today. It's going to be Do Gooder Day. And I'm excited. Gooder is an app. We inventory the food a business sells. When they are closing, they request a pickup. One of our do-gooders using Google Maps API gets it delivered to a nonprofit, preventing the food from going to waste. We're doing business as usual. We're doing gooder. And then the coronavirus hits and everything stops. At least six people have died in an outbreak of the new coronavirus. So at least 565 people are dead. At this moment, we have 22 patients in the United States currently that have coronavirus. Unfortunately, one person passed away overnight. 